Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining our webinar. Um, my name is Micah Whitfield, and I'm the Program Coordinator with Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies Coalition of Georgia. This webinar is presented in partnership with the Georgia Perinatal Association, and um, I've provided some links there for some additional information about some of our other webinars coming up. So again, thank you for joining us. Our presenter today will be Dr. Eller. Uh, Dr. Eller is originally from Ohio. He holds an undergraduate degree from the University of Akron and received his medical degree from Northeastern Ohio College of Medicine. He completed his residency in OBGYN at Altman Hospital in Canton, Ohio, and completed his fellowship training in maternal fetal medicine at the Medical University of South Carolina, where he worked until joining the maternal fetal specialist in 1995. In 2015, Dr. Ella became the Corporate Medical Director of Maternal Fetal Diagnostics Center of Atlanta. He has done extensive research in obstetrics and has been featured nationwide in training films for other obstetricians regarding treatment options and management of preterm labor. Dr. Ella is board certified in OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine. So we have a great speaker today um, on this topic of hypertensive um, disorders in pregnancy, which we know in Georgia um, is very pertinent to um, the populations we serve. And so um, I will turn it over to Dr. Eller. All right, very good. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, hopefully you have some food in front of you. I don't because I didn't think it would be very good for me to have my mouth full when I'm talking to you. But uh, anyway, today we're going to talk about, um, I'm going to uh, update you on hypertension and pregnancy, a uh, little bit of uh, emphasis on the 2013 task force uh, recommendations that came out that was sort of a joint uh, effort with uh, NICHD and with uh, ACOG and um, others. So um, hopefully um, the information that we have will be um, helpful for you today. Um, I think we're gonna have, we'll have time at the end um, for um, questions. So without further ado, here we go. If I can learn how to advance my slides, or do I just say next slide? You should be able to click with your mouse, and it should go to the next slide. Okay. You? Uh, yeah, you should, and there we go. Okay. Um, um, unfortunately, I have no financial disclosures other than I do get paid to see patients. That's about it. So my objectives, um, I would like to identify and discuss uh, some of the changes in the diagnostic uh, criteria for uh, preeclampsia. We'll outline uh, some treatment protocols in the management of uh, hypertension in pregnancy, and then uh, review some of the evidence that's behind some of those uh, recommended changes that were made by the task force. This is just a short list of those who um, were uh, part of the task force, and uh, some of them are very well known within the field of obstetrics and within the field of uh, maternal fetal medicine as well. And they published, uh, it was about a 180-some page uh, treatise on um, hypertension in pregnancy. Um, and then an executive summary was uh, uh, published in the uh, Green Journal. So we'll just um, go over a little bit of the things that they found. I'll start with a case presentation. Um, obviously, I can't ask you questions, so I'll pause um, a little bit and let you think about further evaluation, but then I'll just go to the next slide after that. But this is a 24-year-old Gravita 2, para 0101, uh, meaning that she delivered early with her last baby, history of a 35-week delivery for preeclampsia, who now in this pregnancy presented at 32 weeks based on her last period confirmed with a first trimester ultrasound. And now she has headaches, she has blurry vision, uh, has decreased fetal movement, denies any leaking of amniotic fluid, uh, denies any bleeding, um, and denies preterm labor or contractions. So uh, what do you think your further evaluation would be? Well, the first thing you want to do is check her blood pressure. Her blood pressure is 140 over 100. You do um, complete history and physical exam, and on that exam, you find that she's got some right upper quadrant tenderness. 
Um, you do some labs. You do a, a CMP. You do a CBC, and um, uh, maybe check her urine. Uh, the uh, CMP shows that her AST and her ALT are just mildly elevated, uh, depending on your lab. Usually, around 30 is the uh, upper limit of normal, or somewhere in that ballpark. Um, so these are mildly elevated. A platelet count is 121,000, which does tend to be a little bit low for pregnancy. Um, fetal heart tones are category one, meaning that the uh, uh, they are reassuring and there are no contractions on the monitor. Um, so with that, then what would be your further evaluation and treatment? So in this case, she was started on magnesium sulfate. She was given a four gram bolus, um, followed by uh, two grams per hour infusion. She was given an injection of beta methasone with the plan of repeating that um, after 24 hours. And my mouse stopped working. Love it when technology doesn't work. Okay, hold on, I can advance the next one for you. Very good. Um, and maybe I'll just say next slide when it's time for the next slide. Uh, the next morning, her platelet count was down just a little bit more at 110,000. Her AST and ALT transaminases were elevated slightly more. Blood pressure was a little bit better at 130 over 80. She still had a severe headache uh, that was not relieved with opioid medication. Uh, an ultrasound was performed and showed an estimated fetal weight at the ninth percentile, which would be uh, intrauterine and growth restriction, um, weighed about 1,200 grams. Cervix was relatively favorable at two centimeters, 80% of face, with a cephalic presentation. So what would be your further management at this point? You can go to the next slide. Okay, I've changed it back. You should be able to. I think oh, I fixed yeah. it. Yeah, you should be able to do it now. There we go. There we go. So um, her labor was induced. Um, I was sort of leading you into that. Um, hopefully you figured that out. Um, induced with um, oxytocin. And approximately 15 hours later, she delivered a viable female infant with APGARs of 8 and 9, weighing 1,300 grams. So the sonographer was pretty close there on the weight. Um, she was continued on magnesium sulfate for 24 hours postpartum. Her headache went away. And her blood pressure normalized by postpartum day one. She was discharged on postpartum day two um, and uh, to be seen within a week in the office to make sure that her blood pressures uh, remained normal. Um, well, what would your management be for the next pregnancy? And uh, basically, um, we do know, and we'll talk a little bit about it here, but low-dose aspirin, usually in this country, that's 81 milligrams a day. Um, the range is anywhere from 60 to 150 milligrams, depending on where you are, um, has been shown in patients who are at increased risk. And now the United States Preventative Services Task Force recommends in patients who, are, who have at least one high risk factor or more than one moderate risk factors that they should be offered low-dose aspirin in the subsequent pregnancy. We usually start that at about... Uh, by about 12 weeks and continue it through the entire pregnancy. All right, let's go through a little bit of background. Um, hypertension affects uh, roughly 8 to 10 percent of all pregnancies, um, and those numbers are increasing, at least in the United States. They are increasing. Um, it is one of the leading causes of maternal and fetal mortality. Um, some of those um, we've we've learned from task force task forces in uh, Georgia, uh, some of which are preventable. Um, and uh, the, the bottom line is aggressive treatment of hyperintensive emergencies um, should be undertaken uh, with blood pressures above about 160 over either 100 or 110. Um, 
because uh, blood pressures above that increase the risk for stroke, um, which can obviously then hemorrhagic stroke, which can obviously then lead to um, severe morbidity or and or um, mortality. Um, it is considered a disease basically of placentation, and um, it can have many different effects on both the maternal and the fetal units, and we'll talk about some of those. We've been searching forever for serum markers, um, and I'll talk about a few of those serum markers, but nothing has been the holy grail that has gotten us to the point where we can say every time when you have this, mom has preeclampsia or every time or will get preeclampsia or every time when you don't mom will not get preeclampsia unfortunately we're not there yet um but we're still looking um and it it recently has been found to be a very strong risk factor just as gestational diabetes is a risk factor for type 2 diabetes later in life um, preeclampsia is a strong risk factor for cardiovascular disease, including atherosclerotic heart disease and hypertension uh, later in life. So it, uh, uh, it, it, those patients should be followed, um, and their diet and their lifestyle can affect their risks later in life. Um, so that's an important um, sort of advance recently um, that we've, we've learned. Um, it affects about 10% worldwide, and there, as I mentioned, there has been about a 25% increase in the United States. Um, some of that is due to, uh, we don't know what all the reasons are, but some of the potential reasons include um, moms uh, waiting until older ages to get pregnant, um, maternal obesity, as you know, is a significant problem and continues to get worse. Um, in this country, um, and that increases the risk, certainly, of preeclampsia, among other complications of pregnancy. Um, and sicker moms uh, tend to be getting pregnant as well, so all of that sort of contributes to the increase. Um, we uh, have had an increase in understanding, and um, you, you should think of it as sort of a global um, you know, affect a systemic problem um, in mom. The etiology still remains unclear. Like I said, we're still looking for that one thing that's going to tell us exactly. But there is definitely, uh, it's a multi-system disease, um, does tend to be under-recognized. Um, and um, we have not really uh, improved the outcome very much. Um, and in the, as far as the outcome of babies, a lot of uh, our advances have been on the neonatal side, but on the uh, prenatal side, we uh, maybe beta, beta methadone and um, magnesium sulfate have improved outcomes uh, to some extent, but, but overall, we have not significantly improved um, outcomes in this area. Um, historical context, this is, uh, problems like this have been known since the 17th century. And um, eclampsia has been recognized since the 1700s. Uh, the term toxemia, which many of you have probably heard, was uh, coined in 1849 because they thought that preeclampsia was a buildup of toxic chemicals um, in the circulation. And in some ways, they weren't too far from uh, being correct, um, although they thought a treatment was, like for many other things, uh, bloodletting, obviously that didn't work. One of the more humorous um, findings, quote, scientific findings, was in 1983 when they thought that there was a parasitic worm that might be causing this, and they found in the end it was just um, a, 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 an artifact that was seen on the slides um, and not a, a, a real issue. So uh, sometimes even scientists get fooled. Um, in terms of classification, uh, there's preeclampsia or eclampsia, there's chronic hypertension, there's chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia, and there's gestational hypertension. And um, we'll go through those uh, one by one. One of the older terms that uh, is no longer used is transient hypertension. 
one of the older terms that's no longer used, although you'll hear it on units all the time, is pregnancy-induced hypertension. Both of those should leave your vocabulary immediately. Um, they are no longer valid uh, terms uh, to be used. All right, I lost my ability to advance the slides once again. There we go. Oops. Oh. <laughs> um, is there a way to go backwards? If not, uh, yeah. then yeah. don't worry about it. Oh, we can go back. There you go. Was this a slide? Okay, one more. One more, okay. One more. There you go. Oh, uh, yeah, now, there you go. That's okay. perfect. Okay. So, um, again, the emphasis is on this is a multi-system problem. It's thought that there may be a problem with placentation because the way the um, spiral arterioles invade into the maternal uh, side of the um, of the decidua, um, uh, what used to be the endometrium and now is the decidua that they're pregnant, um, there's a problem with those blood vessels. They, they're more constricted. Um, than what they should be, um, and that's thought to start actually in the second trimester, but it turns out to be a multi-system problem that um, can affect many parts of, uh, of uh, the maternal and fetal unit. Um, we're no longer 100% reliable reliant on proteinuria, although if you do have elevated blood pressure and proteinuria, you do have preeclampsia if it happens after 20 weeks. Um, but uh, you don't need it if you have elevated blood pressures and you have a low platelet count, if you have elevated blood pressures and new onset of cerebral symptoms or elevated creatinine or elevated liver functions, you don't need the uh, protein, proteinuria to diagnose preeclampsia. Now, the, the uh, cerebral or visual symptoms, that can be difficult um, because obviously many women have headaches during pregnancy. Obviously, if they have seizures, they probably have eclampsia, and then it's fairly easy. But um, if they're uh, if they have not had headaches, and now all of a sudden they have new onset headaches, especially that don't aren't resolved with uh, mild um, medications such as acetaminophen or something like that, and especially if they're not resolved with opioids, um, then um, you may be dealing with um, headaches that are a result of uh, preeclampsia. Uh, so you have to be careful with that. If you have new onset visual symptoms, or if they say this is the worst headache in my life or something like that, then then you very well may be dealing with uh, manifestations of preeclampsia. The liver functions, if they're double um, what norm, uh, the upper limit of normal, then that's considered um, uh, the uh, criteria. Um, if the serum creatinine, either if it doubles from what the baseline was, um, and, that, and because of that, many times in patients who are at increased risk for preeclampsia will get baseline labs in the beginning of the pregnancy. But if it's greater than 1.1, then you have renal dysfunction, and then it's likely uh, preeclampsia. If you do have the proteinuria, um, either 300 uh, milligrams in a 24-hour urine uh, collection, um, if you have more than one plus on a couple of occasions on a urinalysis, or if it's more than 0 0.3 on your protein to creatinine ratio, um, then that can be considered abnormal proteinuria. We used to uh, consider massive proteinuria over five grams a uh, sign of uh, preeclampsia uh, pre with severe features, but that's no longer considered the case. Um, so the presence of proteinuria can help you diagnose, but massive proteinuria does not make the preeclampsia worse. Um, intrauterine growth restriction is no longer a criteria because there are many possible causes, um, but it may be present. Other associated findings, severe edema can be present, but it's, it's not part of the criteria, again, because edema is so common during pregnancy. Now, if they have pulmonary edema, that is a severe feature of uh, preeclampsia. Um, well, what about those biomarkers that I was telling you about? Well, there are certain anti-angiogenic, meaning going against blood vessel formation, and that's the SFLT1 or the soluble endoglobulin. So if you have too much of those, you're not able to make the blood vessels like you should. 
um, or if you have not enough of the placental growth factor or the vascular endothelial growth factor, um, those are pro-angiogenic biomarkers, meaning when you have more of those around, you can make more blood vessels, so uh, the tiny blood vessels. So, um, if, so if there's not enough of those or too much of the others, then that may be a sign of uh, preeclampsia. Again, we don't have the end-all, be-all biomarker, and so those are interesting for scientific purposes, but they don't really help in the clinical setting. So what are some clinical risk factors? Nulliparity is a clinical risk factor, or if there's a new dad, um, then, they're, that's all, they're, then they go back to the risk of uh, nulliparity. Also, if it's been a very long time since they've been pregnant, more than 10 years, then it's kind of like being nulliparous again. So that can be a risk factor. If they had preeclampsia with a previous pregnancy, they can be up to uh, seven times higher risk in the subsequent pregnancy. And the earlier they had it and the worse it was, the higher the risk in the next pregnancy. If they have chronic hypertension or if they have chronic renal disease, they're at much higher risk. If they have thrombophilia, such as uh, lupus anticoagulant or anticardiolipin antibodies, they're at higher risk. If they have multifetal pregnancy, um, then they're at higher risk. If they underwent IVF, even if it's a singleton pregnancy, then they're at higher risk. Um, fortunately, our, um, uh, in, our infertility colleagues have become much more careful and um, are not giving us the number of um, higher order multiples that they used to. Um, they used to see so many more triplet pregnancies than I do now, and that's a, that's a good thing. Um, that we're not seeing as many multifetal pregnancies, but even twins are at higher risk for preeclampsia. Even if there's a family history of preeclampsia, and even on the father's side, there may be an increased risk. Obviously, on the maternal side, the risk is higher, but um, even on the fa uh, father's side, there can be an increased risk. Um, if mom has diabetes, there's an increased risk. Obesity, as I discussed, increased risk. And any autoimmune problem, the most common would be lupus or the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome that I just mentioned. The extremes of age, more than 40 or less than 18, they're at increased risk. Um, African-American race is at increased risk. Um, if there's hydrops fatalis for any reason, um, then mom is at higher risk for developing um, preeclampsia. Um, it's called, uh, it, it has a name and it's called Miro syndrome, M-I-R-R-O-R -R -R syndrome, uh, because the mom starts to look like the fetus and uh, becomes very edematous and her blood pressure goes up and so on and so forth. If they either have unexplained intrauterine growth restriction in this pregnancy um, or in, in uh, the pre a previous pregnancy, then they uh, would, can be at increased risk for preeclampsia. I had a labor and delivery nurse one time who we had dated with a first trimester scan. She came in at 17 weeks with intrauterine growth restriction, and we finally figured out at 28 weeks when she came in with a blood pressure of 220 over 120, the reason for her intrauterine growth restriction. The workup up to that point had been negative, um, and it was preeclampsia. Um, if there's an abruption in a previous pregnancy, they can be at increased risk. If there's an unexplained fetal demise, they, they can be at increased risk for preeclampsia. Again, the prolonged interpregnancy interval because then it becomes more like the first pregnancy. A hydatidiform mole, and that's one of the cases where, um, where you might get it actually even before 20 weeks. Um, they might develop signs and symptoms of preeclampsia. Um, but typically, your standard definition is all of these findings occur after uh, 20 weeks gestation. Uh, susceptibility genes, there's been research in this, and it's interesting, but um, again, it's not really clinically helpful uh, yet, but uh, stay tuned because it may be in the future. Uterine artery dopplers may be uh, uh, indicative if you show basically increased resistance. Now, um, none of the randomized trials have shown a difference but because um, there has been more and more data on using um, low-dose aspirin during pregnancy, my own clinical practice is if I 
uh, if we demonstrate um, um, increased resistance in the beginning of the pregnancy, we go ahead and put those patients on a uh, low-dose aspirin. Now, the executive summary, as you remember, was in 2013 before some of the evidence came out um, strongly in favor of low-dose aspirin. So uh, at that time, they did not um, endorse routine screening. Like I said, within our own practice, we do it, um, although uh, the literature is not quite caught up with that yet. So it's not um, absolutely necessary to do uterine artery dopplers. We typically do them in the first trimester uh, to screen. Um, this is what a normal uterine artery doppler looks like. This means um, there's low resistance. Um, this is how fast the blood's flowing during systole. This is how fast the blood's flowing during diastole um, within the uh, uterine artery, and that uh, indicates a low resistance system. As opposed to this, and you can see the difference, um, how fast the blood's flowing during systole versus diastole. And then there's this notching um, in here. It looks like a notch. You saw the other one did not. There was no notch. Um, so this increase, it suggests increased resistance and suggests that this patient may be at risk for uh, preeclampsia. So that patient I would put on um, low-dose aspirin, 81 milligrams a day. In terms of the blood pressure criteria, it really did not change with the task force recommendations. 140 over 90, uh, two times at least six hours apart, and that's when the patient is resting, not when they've run into your office and they're late for their appointment, and they sit down and they're huffing and puffing, and you take their blood pressure and it's high. If it is high in that setting, you need to let them relax for a little while and then come back and take the blood pressure a little bit later and see if it is, in fact, um, elevated. If you have a blood pressure of 160 over 110, except in times of extreme stress, then that's um, virtually always considered abnormal. But um, again, you want to have the patient at rest. So if they're anxious from uh, running into your office, you want to wait a little bit uh, before uh, taking their blood pressure. Now, obviously, if you take it at that time and it's normal, then you're good. But if it's high, then you probably need to let them rest and not rest on their left side. Even preeclamptics resting on their left side, their blood pressure will go down. Um, in, when you're trying to make a diagnosis, they need to be sitting quietly and relaxed. So that's uh, the key there. Now, when once you've diagnosed it, you can treat them by putting them on their side, and that will uh, bring their blood pressure down. But uh, when you're trying to make the diagnosis, they need to be sitting. Um, proteinuria, again, one plus on a urine dip, especially if it's on two separate urine dip sticks. Um, 300 milligrams in the 24-hour or the 0.3 on the protein creatinine ratio, as I already mentioned. And again, it's not important. Um, I, I've still seen many uh, people repeat these over and over again. Once you've made your diagnosis, you don't really need to repeat this um, uh, uh, during because it doesn't really help you in terms of the course of the disease. Um, again, the preferred nomenclature, we're very, very accustomed to saying mild preeclampsia, severe preeclampsia. That implies that mild preeclampsia and severe preeclampsia are different diseases. They're not. They're the same disease on uh, different, uh, uh, different uh, ends of the spectrum in terms of, of, of how severe it is. So we say with or without severe features. Um, uh, along that continuum instead of saying mild or severe. In terms of, um, well, I've got it here. The, the severe features are the 160 over 110, as I mentioned. Um, cerebral symptoms, if you can attribute them to or preeclampsia, like I said, it may be difficult if mom's had um, headaches her whole entire pregnancy and they haven't really changed, then that can be difficult. If they have epigastric pain, uh, and, uh, it, you know, clearly epigastric pain um, that does not quickly go away with um, antacids or something like that, and or if their liver functions are elevated, um, then they, um, then you can make the diagnosis of uh, uh, preeclampsia with severe features. If they've clearly got some new onset uh, uh, visual symptoms, uh, then that could be associated with preeclampsia. Um, if they have hypoxia, which could be indicative of um, pulmonary edema, then um, they, 
they would have preeclampsia with severe features. Now, obviously, you need to watch for pulmonary embolus, which would not be associated with preeclampsia. Um, but assuming that they don't have that and the hypoxia is due to pulmonary edema, then likely it's preeclampsia with severe features. If you have um, abnormal fetal heart rate tracing, um, that can be uh, assigned. Intrauterine growth restriction, again, that is not a criteria for severe feature because IUGR is so common, but uh, you can see it with uh, preeclampsia. Um, serum creatinine, again, more than uh, 1.1 or more than double the baseline. Um, we've already mentioned all of these things. Platelet count less than 100,000. Uh, without severe features is basically the blood pressures uh, greater than 140 over 90 um, uh, under the circumstances we've already mentioned, and more than three, uh, and proteinuria. Those uh, uh, patients have preeclampsia without severe features. Gestational hypertension is uh, blood pressures of 140 over 90 with no proteinuria and no other uh, severe features. Um, those patients um, are just gestational hypertension. No, I did it again. Um, prevention, uh, low-dose aspirin, as I mentioned, has been shown to be helpful with a large meta-analysis that was recently published. Um, I've got a little bit in here on the data behind uh, low-dose aspirin. Um, it kind of comes and goes in the 90s. There were some trials that showed no difference, but then, um, again, recent data would suggest otherwise. Nothing else has helped. Antioxidants have not helped. Calcium supplementation has not helped. Bed rest is not, activity restriction does not prevent preeclampsia. Sometimes once you've made the diagnosis of preeclampsia, Activity restriction can maybe buy you some time um, until you have to deliver them. Um, so it may be helpful in that setting, but you're not going to you're not going to improve chronic hypertension, and you're not going to improve uh, you're not going to reduce the risk of developing preeclampsia by placing uh, patients at bed rest. Um, and uh, again, uh, bed rest we don't have any evidence that bed rest helps with anything. Um, but again. And uh, from a clinical standpoint, uh, we have been able to buy a little time before uh, de before having to move toward delivery, especially if we're trying to get like the 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours uh, for maximum effective betamethasone um, prior to delivery. These are some of the earlier trials um, that showed no significant difference with aspirin all the way back to 1993. Um, and the NICHD trial, there were two trials done by the Maternal Fetal Medicine Units Network. One was on the uh, low-risk patients, and one was on high-risk patients, neither of which was effective. So when I was a fellow, we thought, well, we thought aspirin might help, but it probably doesn't. Well, then uh, recently, uh, meta-analysis came out um, that demonstrated a, um, a reduced, uh, a, a decreased relative risk if your relative risk is less than one, that means you have a reduction. And if the confidence interval does not cross one, that means you have a reduction, which was uh, true in this case. Um, and so uh, the low-dose aspirin uh, was shown to help um, in a meta in a large, in, in two actually meta-analyses. So we do use it now. And like I said, the United States uh, Services Preventative Services Task Force does recommend using it, and uh, the American Congress of OBGYN and Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine also agreed with that and said that it is effective. Again, none of the other treatments have been shown uh, to be effective. A low-salt diet does not help um, in terms of uh, preeclampsia. Um, it does, uh, well, what about the course of the disease um, in terms of preeclampsia? Progressive disease, um, usually it's late in pregnancy, can be gradual worsening, although we have seen some of them that um, yeah, worsen over a relative short period of time. About 2% of the time, you will get eclampsia, um, and you can get eclampsia even if there were no severe features prior to the onset of seizures, although um, many of the patients will have severe features prior to the onset, and that's why in those patients we do give them um, IV magnesium sulfate. 
but um, uh, in those without severe features, um, it, it's individualized, but it's not required um, to give those patients magnesium sulfate for um, uh, seizure prophylaxis. And we typically do that right around the time of delivery. Um, and a large trial, it was called the MAGPI trial, um, but a large uh, multi-center trial in this country did show that magnesium works better. Our European colleagues used to think dilantin works better, but uh, that trial showed that um, magnesium works better for um, eclamptic seizures, both treatment and prevention of eclamptic seizures. Um, uh, the, again, you can have the uh, end organ damage, as we've already talked about. Um, you can have abruption. Uh, the, the worst, uh, the most severe features, uh, such as a liver hematoma or rupture, um, can also lead to, uh, uh, to death um, in this particular population. Um, they can uh, develop DIC, they can develop stroke, we've mentioned that already. Uh, they can develop the need for ventilation from the um, pulmonary edema um, and so on and so forth. And occasionally, uh, fortunately it's relatively rare, but occasionally you will have patients who, um, fortunately most of the time it's for the short term, will require dialysis. Um, and uh, many times uh, you might need to give uh, transfusions as well. You, the delivery of the placenta does re lead to a resolution. Um, many times it's not as fast as what we would like for it to be, but it will eventually uh, lead to resolution of the disease process. Usually it's fairly quickly in terms of headache. Most of the time by the next morning, um, and sometimes immediately after delivery, their headache will resolve. Um, Fortunately, they'll tend to diurese, usually within 48 hours. Many times that's when you can tell that your patient is getting better, is uh, they no longer have oliguria and they're starting to diurese um, and mobilize that fluid and get it off. Um, the, when there's severe proteinuria, it may take longer and the hypertension um, can actually temporarily worsen and usually improves within four weeks, but can take up to 12 weeks. If you get to six to 12 weeks and they still have hypertension, then they probably have chronic hypertension at that point. Um, but you need to follow them closely, even postpartum, especially their blood pressures, and treat them to keep their blood pressures out of the stroke range that we talked about before. Um, and they may have a delayed postpartum onset. That's why it's good um, to, if you're concerned about preeclampsia to see these patients probably one week out, probably if you have a high index of suspicion, I'd see them again at two weeks out, and so on. And if you have to put them on antihypertensives after delivery, um, I would recommend seeing them every week um, in the office uh, to make sure that your treatment is um, adequate. Um, features by organ system, again, cardiopulmonary, you can get the hypertension, you get a reduced intravascular volume, that's what leads to the edema, um, and uh, the edema can be uh, usually pathologic edema, spatial edema, or if they've had uh, more than five pound weight gain in a week, uh, but again, we don't use that uh, as criteria, unfortunately, because edema is so common in pregnancy, uh, but, it, but you will see it um, in preeclamptic as well. Um, if they can, they'll have increased afterload, and that's because their system, systemic vascular resistance is high. Afterload is what the heart has to pump against to get the blood to move into the circulation. Um, ejection fraction is usually normal, um, but it can drop a little bit. Uh, if it drops a lot, then you're probably dealing with peripartum cardiomyopathy. A normal ejection fraction is in the 50 to 60 percent range. Um, if it's 40%, it could be due to preeclampsia. If it's 20%, you're probably dealing with um, peripartum cardiomyopathy. Uh, pulmonary edema, again, you have the decreased colloid oncotic pressure um, and capillary leak, but then you've got these uh, increased pulmonary artery pressures um, as well that can lead to pulmonary edema. Renal, we've talked about a lot of these things. Typically, in a normal pregnancy, your GFR um, is is increased over baseline, but in with preeclampsia, it can reduce as much as 30 
uh, to 40 percent, the renal plasma flow to a little bit lesser extent. But again, you can have elevated serum creatinine. Um, and um, elevated uric acid can sometimes be seen as well. Um, if there's anybody on the call, any physicians on the call that are uh, getting ready to take the boards, especially written boards, glomerular endotheliosis is the classic pathologic finding that you see. Those endothelial cells, they, they become hyperplastic, and you see a whole bunch of them um, when you're looking at the glomeruli under the microscope. That's just for uh, to amaze your friends at parties with things like that. Hematologic. Um, the, there can be a consumptive coagulopathy. Uh, they can become anemic. Um, you can get um, uh, hemolysis. Um, but in some patients, um, you'll also see hemoconcentration. So, um, yeah, if they come in and you get a hemoglobin of 13 and an hematocrit of 45, you think, oh, this patient's doing great. Well, they actually may be hemoconcentrated, so you have to be careful with that. And especially after you deliver and the diuresis and the, uh, the uh, fluid comes back into the uh, vascular circulation, then that's when they'll really, really drop their hemoglobin. So you got to be careful about that. Um, most of the time, unless they're really, really severe and get into that consumptive coagulopathy, your PT and your PTT and your fibrinogen will be normal. Many times if I have low platelets, um, I will check a fibrinogen, um, which typically tends to be a little higher during pregnancy um, than usual uh, because of the increased um, uh, um, production by the liver. Um, so if you, if you have a low normal or just below the normal range fibrinogen, then that's a problem, and you want to look at the rest of your coags um, at that point. In terms of hepatic, you'll get some fibrin deposition in, in those little uh, periportal sinuses, um, and um, you can get ischemia and hemorrhage. Um, the epigastric pain uh, tip, it can be the only thing that you see uh, in a preeclamptic. They may have very mildly elevated blood pressures and have that epigastric pain. And, you know, you're seeing their blood pressures at 130 over 80 and they've got the epigastric pain. You're thinking, well, they're fine. It must not be preeclampsia. Well, it very well could be. Um, so you want to have a high index of suspicion for that. Very occasionally you'll get diabetes insipidus with severe hepatic dysfunction. Um, that's when they pee an awful lot, um, but that's a, a, a pretty unusual thing. Again, the headaches we talked about, um, and if they're throbbing or piercing, and if they're really severe um, and they don't go away despite analgesics, those are the kinds of, and new onset headaches that they haven't had um, throughout the rest of the pregnancy, then that may be an issue. Um, you can get many different um, findings on the vision. Uh, you can get hyperreflexia, especially patellar reflexes, um, or ankle clonus. Um, that can be suggestive of preeclampsia. Um, seizures happen about one out of 400 times in preeclampsia without severe features and about 2% of the time with severe features. And you can get cerebral edema um, and um, you can get some ischemic brain damage. Most of the time, everything is reversible, fortunately, unless they have a hemorrhagic stroke. And that's why you want to treat those blood pressures to try to reduce the risk of a hemorrhagic stroke. And uh, that's, uh, that's it on that. Other, uh, you can get pancreatitis, that's pretty rare. In terms of the fetal unit, you can get the growth restriction as we talked about. You can get low fluid. Um, you can get a fetal death. Uh, the one there used to be a misnomer that IUGR and um, all of those things would accelerate the fetal maturation. Well, it does not, um, unfortunately, accelerate the fetal maturation. Now, beta methasone can accelerate fetal maturation, but a small uh, but an, but IUGR um, in quote stress from that does not um, improve maturation. They still behave like any baby at that gestational age. Um, about 1% of the time without severe features, you can get an eruption, and 3% of the time with it, you can get it. Again, you can get that mirror syndrome I talked about. You can get the abnormal Doppler, Dopplers because the circulation is bad. So your initial evaluation, you want to check for all those things I just mentioned. You want to check for protein. You want to check your CBC. 
You want to check your liver functions, your serum creatinine, all the stuff we talked about. You want to get the ultrasound to look for a small baby, look at the fluid, um, look at your uh, Doppler um, to see uh, those are affected. This is a normal umbilical artery Doppler. Looks somewhat similar to that uterine artery Doppler that I showed you earlier with low resistance. This, uh, you don't want to see this. If you see this, then you need to be moving towards the delivery room. This is a reverse flow. That means when the baby's heart is at rest in diastole, it's, the blood flow is actually going backwards in the umbilical artery, back towards the baby um, and not towards the placenta. So this is a reverse flow. And if you see that, it's time to cut bait. Um, this is just a high, um, high resistance, but you still got some diastolic flow there um, toward the placenta. This is absent in diastolic flow. That means the blood literally stops when the baby's heart is at rest um, in between heartbeats as it's moving toward the placenta. This is the ductus venosus. This is inside the baby's abdomen um, and uh, in uh, within the liver. This is where blood bypasses from the left side to the right side. And this is a, a normal. You want to see diastolic flow in that. And if you get the reverse flow in that, then that's um, uh, also bad prognosis and you probably need to take this baby for delivery as well. Um, sometimes we can look at the MCA Dopplers. This is in the head. If the, You always want higher resistance in the head than you have in the umbilical artery. And if you don't, if there's less resistance in the head, it means the baby's saying, um, I don't have much blood, so I need to send it to my brain because my brain's the most important thing. And if you see that, then that's a problem um, as well. Um, well, what do you do when you have preeclampsia? Well, it's never wrong to put them in the hospital. Sometimes you can follow them as an outpatient if you're comfortable, but again, it's never wrong to put them in the hospital. We talked about rest already. We talked about getting the ultrasound. Check the fluid because low fluid can be associated with things going south. Um, you want to check the non-stress test. You want to check your labs. It sort of depends on how, uh, um, how bad you think the disease is. Um, you may you probably want to check labs at least weekly if they don't have severe features. You may want to check it more often depending on the clinical situation. Um, you can feed them a regular diet. It doesn't have to be low salt um, until you think it's time for delivery. Uh, the key is regular assessment um, of these patients. Uh, this is just a flow sheet from that task force. If you have the eclampsia, if you have the pulmonary edema, if you have DIC, if you have blood pressure you can't control, if the fetus is not viable yet, um, if you have those abnormal labs like the very abnormal liver functions, the very abnormal platelets, um, if there is an abruption, if there's a fetal death, then you just deliver. You don't wait any longer if you have any of those things you deliver. If they're under 34 weeks, then um, sometimes, Again, with severe features, it's never wrong to deliver them, but if they're in a tertiary care center with severe features, but they're relatively stable, you might want to try to give them steroids and wait 48 hours and then deliver. Um, if they have reverse flow, I just tend to deliver those patients. But if their blood pressures were high and initially you were able to easily control them, um, and uh, they're in the hospital and you can watch them closely, then you may want to try to get the 24 to 48 hours of steroids um, on board for delivering. Um, if, uh, if, they, um, uh, if they have severe features, it's always the right answer to deliver them once they reach 34 weeks. If they don't have severe features, usually we'll try to deliver them at about 37 weeks. So um, there's lots of guidelines out there. Um, we've talked mostly about the guidelines from the task force um, and uh, all of that. Those are probably uh, the best guidelines to use. Again, with the hypertension, basically all you're doing is preventing stroke, um, and uh, th that's really all that you're doing um, in that scenario. Um, you're not making them less likely to progress or anything like that. Um, so um, you just got to watch them closely. Um, and the 160 over 110, you always want to treat those pregnant, those patients. Um, drugs uh, that, and in terms of chronic hypertension, 
Again, you want to use the same sort of criteria. You're basically just prevent, preventing the same things that you do in non-pregnant patients, which is stroke, which is heart failure, things like that. Um, you're not preventing IEGR, you're not preventing preeclampsia or any of those pregnancy complications by treating ba patients who have chronic hypertension um, during pregnancy. And again, the definition for chronic would be blood pressures of 140 over 90, either pre-pregnancy or less than 20 weeks gestation, then they have chronic hypertension. And then you can give them antihypertensives. Um, and again, our, our favorite tends to be labetalol or um, uh, um, methyl dopa or um, nifedipine, long-acting nifedipine uh, during pregnancy. Um, the things that might affect the way you dose your medications, motility decreases in pregnancy, um, gastric pH goes up, so that affects some medicines. They have an increased vascular volume. Bottom line is usually they need more drugs more often when they're pregnant than when they're not pregnant. That's sort of the bottom line. Your liver metabolizes a lot of the drugs faster. Um, again, you'll see anything in the range from 140 over 90 to 150 over 100 as the goal for treatment uh, of chronic hypertension uh, during pregnancy. Uh, labetalol is both an alpha and a beta blocker. Um, one, one key on labetalol is if, if mom comes in, she's used cocaine, and she has a hypertensive crisis from the cocaine, don't use labetalol because um, it's going to block the beta blockers. It's going to block the beta receptors but not do so well with the alpha receptors, and you can that can lead to ischemia and, um, and heart attack and things like that. So you cannot use labetalol. That's the one time you can't use labetalol is in with cocaine that's causing hypertension. Otherwise, labetalol is an excellent choice, both for chronic hypertension and for acute treatment. Chronic hypertension, oral, and acute treatment, IV. Um, nivetapine, uh, again, is fine. Cannot use enalapril during pregnancy. It causes oligodramnios and kidney failure, um, but you can use it during uh, breastfeeding. Um, atenolol, any of the beta blockers can be associated with IUGR, um, so you got to be careful with that, uh, but it, they're not absolutely contraindicated. Methyl dopa um, is, uh, has a lot of side effects, but is safe uh, during pregnancy, so um, it's been around forever. But again, it has a lot of side effects, and that's why many have preferred either nifedipine or labetalol to um, methyl dopa. No benefit in treating non-severe hypertension um, for the reasons that I've already mentioned. Um, and uh, that's about it. We've gone over most of that. Um, there, there's some persistent endothelial dysfunction and insulin resistance. That's probably why there's the future heart problems. They're at least double um, the risk of heart problems in the future. And um, sevenfold increased risk. Uh, for problems in the future when they have severe preeclampsia that's early, and, um, and that's uh, sort of the bottom line there. And that's really all I had. Um, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions uh, that anybody might have at this point. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ella. I do see one hand raised. Uh, let's see. Uh, Tia, I'm going to take you off of mute. Uh, Tia, if you want to go ahead and say your question. Hi, I was just wondering um, what the average um, blood pressure that we wanted to keep under for the preeclampsia. I got the 140, but the bottom number I missed. The slide went too quickly. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, the the goal for chronic hypertension, uh, depending on which guideline you're using, uh, is uh, one. Uh, 140 to 150 over 90 to 100 for chronic hypertension. Now, for um, preeclampsics, you just want to keep it below 160 over, essentially 160 over 110. Some guidelines use 160 over 100. Um, the key is the 160, and that's mainly, again, you're preventing stroke and heart failure and things like that. Hmm. So your, your institution should have um, protocols for um, hypertensive emergencies. Um, and the best IV drugs for that are either labetalol 
um, and you usually, usually the protocol is 20, then 40, then 40, then 80, up to a maximum of 320 um, every 10 minutes. Or hydralazine, you can give either 5 or 10, um, but that one you've got to wait 20 minutes in between um, when you're giving that. Um, or you can use PO short acting procardia 10 milligrams. Um, and you can use that about every 10 minutes as well. Um, uh, those are sort of the keys for the hypertensive crisis. But yeah, in, in the preeclamptic, you're really not going to improve outcomes with um, anything, uh, you know, other than that, other than treating to prevent uh, the stroke and so on. Now, if their blood pressures are that high, they need to be in the hospital and be uh, monitored closely in the hospital. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, we have another question from Julie. Julie, I'm going to unmute you. Julie? Are you still there, Julie? Francis? All right. Let's see if we have... I see another question from Kathy. Kathy, did you want to ask your question? Hello? Oh, yes. Are you are you taking my question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. What about when the systolic is high but the diastolic is just borderline like 90? Say like that's a, that's a great, over 90s. That's a great question. And in terms of um, diagnosis of uh, preeclampsia, it's either or. So either 140 over 90 or 160 over 110 for severe features. Now, in terms of treatment, the same is true. Either or. Um, if you're treating for hypertensive crisis, um, uh, 160 for the systolic, um, and again, some use 110 and some use 100 um, for the diastolic. Okay. Got another question in the comments. This one says, I've seen the term hypertensive urgency recently. Can you speak a moment about what the diagnosis means in relationship to pregnancy? Not familiar with that term. So I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know if they're talking about a, you know, a hypertensive emergency, which is the b blood pressures above 160 over 100 or 110. Um, that's a, probably the only thing that I would be aware of that they might be uh, talking about. But otherwise, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. And I think we have one more question. Let's see. Okay, we may have gotten all of those. And Julie, I'm going to try one more time, I think. Let's see. Okay, Julie, can, are you able to say your question now? Okay, I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe you can send it to us afterwards and I will forward it to Dr. Eller. Well, other than that, I don't see any other questions. Yeah, I think we've answered them all. Great. Um, okay, well, thank you uh, very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Let's see. Yep, those are all the questions. So um, what you'll get after the webinar is an email um, just stating um, that you attended the webinar and there'll be a link to uh, the evaluation. And um, if you need CE credits, you just um, put that on the evaluation. There is one contact hour for nurses. So.
um, you'll get an email from us. So thank you very much, and thank you, Dr. Ella, for a great webinar. Thank you so much. Y'all have a great day. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.